Hey, everybody, it's Mark Patterson. I'm back again with another great episode of Finding Your Summit, all about people overcoming adversity and finding their way. And today I've got a superstar. She's a rock star. I can't wait to get into the pod. Please stay patient while I get through this. But I want to once again refer everybody to my website, www.markpattersonnfl.com. We continue to raise money. We just raised another $10,000. Dollars for Amelia's Everest, 100% of all those proceeds go to Higher Ground, which is located here in Sun Valley. They also have offices in New York and LA, but it's all about empowerment and that's what they do. So, so fortunate to be blessed um, to be associated with those people. We are now on about 240 podcasts. Um, please continue to listen. Uh, anything you, that you can do to bring the love uh, by giving a ratings and review. It helps to elevate the popularity of this show, um, which is not about me, but it's about these wonderful guests uh, guests that I have on. And of course, at the end of the day, we all need to be inspired. And of course, you can also go in and see the movie the NFL did, Searching for the Summit. There's a little red button you can push. You can see the whole thing. It's 30 minutes and it is up for an Emmy. So I'm very proud of that. And also there's a little button, a YouTube button on that channel on my website. And if you go in, all you got to do is subscribe. And once we get to a thousand subscribers, we're very close to 800. Then we're going to raise money um, given by the ads that are served on that particular channel. And then we can push that money over to uh, higher ground, which is ultimately the goal of giving back and paying it forward. Okay, let's get into today's amazing guest. I've had a lot of people on and this one I am as excited as can be. First of all, let me introduce Ava Haller. Ava, how are you doing? I'm doing very well. I'm very excited and delighted to hear about all the good things you are doing. And one of your best things today is to, of course, ask me to your show. Well, so I'm thank delighted you. to be here. Well, you're you're so kind and 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 especially so I need to set this up for the audience and and I want to I want to repeat something I said to you prior to going on live, which is this is that I've had a lot of people in in sports uh, in 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 terms of I just had somebody recently on who's an actor I've had a number of actors on on their show I've had people overcome just amazing things. And one of the, 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 the categories that I've not filled that's always been on my bucket list, just because I'm so fascinated for anybody who actually was able to survive that, which was the Holocaust. And so you are somebody that has actually survived the Holocaust. And I, I, I want to go back and, and talk about where you grew up and how this all thing, you're doing so many wonderful things now, and we'll get to that. Um, but uh, if you could bring us back and and share, I know you've shared it a thousand times, but you know it's just such an amazing story on on how you survived. Um, it's incredible. So let's go back to when you're growing up, where you grew up, and and you know Hitler's Nazi Germany was taking over all these different countries, and and you fell into that in that category. So tell us how this all played out for you when you were a young child? You know, I wasn't so young. I was 14 when uh, Hitler occupied Hungary. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I was very young in terms of feeling my oats. You know, I, I was an adolescent. My brother was a freedom fighter. He took me along a couple of times to the night printing of brochures and and uh, trying to get information to all the resistance. And so uh, I felt like a, a brave freedom fighter. <clears throat> In a way, it felt more like an adventure than death. Well, it, it's- I never it, expected to not to succeed because I had my brother who was seven years older and whom I adored. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just felt that we had a big adventure. Uh, of course, this is sort of like, uh, like Alice in Wonderland kind of a thing, you know. On one level, uh, Hitler occupied most of Europe by 1939. Uh, we every night 
listen to Radio Free Europe with the Voice of America, sort of feeling that it's coming closer and closer, but we didn't think that we would be affected because Horty, the ruler of Hungary, the admiral, we, we never had an ocean, but we do have an admiral. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, he was protecting his Jews because it was the Jewish rich people who uh, created the heavy industry in Hungary and made Budapest into one of the most elegant, Baroque, marvelous cities in, in Europe. And so uh, he did uh, most of it with Jewish money and therefore he liked his Jews. It mm -hmm. was good for him. And that was number one. And number two is that my family has, uh, we were Catholics religion wise with mm -hmm. Jewish ancestry. And so during the first few years of, of Nazis, they did not decide to send us to Auschwitz because we were Catholics, religion-wise, and I was raised Catholic. So those were the two things that makes us different from other Holocaust stories. Mm. We were protected, we were not sent to camp, we were not uh, bothered too much other than reading about Jews in the countryside who were not protected by our Admiral Horty and who were taken uh, to Auschwitz. The countryside Jews were all killed. They were all in the countryside. The Budapest Jews, because they were useful for Horty, we were protected. And were so, you were, were you aware though? I mean, obviously the, the world is aware now, but were you aware at the time? I know you're 14 and, and this is all going down and you were protected, but were you aware these other Jews that that weren't in the Catholic religion were being taken off and being terminated, executed? We knew very little about it. What we did know is that our home in Budapest became a, a way station that people who managed from the countryside to escape Hitler would stay over at our place for a few nights on their way trying to get uh, some Swedish documents, the laissez-passe that the Swedish embassy was giving out and allowed Jews to get out of Hungary. So we were aware of the of what happened on the countryside, but we mostly knew people who managed to escape and went on on their way to England, to America, to wherever. And we did not realize that how protected we were. Now I was a kid, and you know, if you would have had the ability to talk to my parents, maybe you would hear something very different. But I know that we listened to. Uh, Voice of America, Radio Free Europe, every night on the shortwave radio, at which point, uh, when the Nazis actually occupied Budapest, the first thing they did that every Jew had to give in their radios, mm -hmm. their jewelry, and all their possessions. And then the next thing was that we all had to leave our homes and move into the ghetto that was established for Jews, because it was so convenient. Once you got the Jews into a ghetto, then you could just uh, get them together at 6 a.m. And, and put them on trains to, and to be executed, to be gassed. Mm -hmm. But uh, for us, I always looked at it, how fortunate we were that we were the Jews of, of Budapest. And our really, the time that we were uh, in danger or taken was much shorter than of other people. Mm. Of course, then when my brother uh, who was a partisan and was trying to escape to get over to Tito, to Yugoslavia, where they ha had the best resistance groups, uh, there is a new film out, a, a video about the girls, the resistance girls who lived in the woods in the countryside between what was then Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, and how they detonated trains, the Nazi trains. Uh, it was such a, 
a wonderful sense that we didn't just lie down and and let to be killed, but there was a whole group of young men and young women who lived in the woods and who have done some damage to the Nazi cause. Unfortunately, my brother John was um, killed. And uh, we didn't know that until after the war, he didn't come home. And my mother managed to find a number of young people who we discovered were partisans together with my brother, told us the story of how there was this, at night they moved on and on closer and closer to Tito and they found a barn house that had a front door and a back door and they were planning to spend the night there when they started to hear dog barkings and shootings and it was the, the army searching for partisans and my brother who was 21 at the time told his four friends you go I cover for us and they you know he had the one gun and of course the, the four friends came back and told us the story of how my brother was killed tragic um let me ask you about your parents uh in all this were they did they survive all this or were they also put on a train and shipped off? Oh, or? my my parents, because my father felt very Catholic and very Hungarian, and he couldn't believe that that anything can happen to us. Um, in September, when it already looked, you know, I remember why should you? <laughs> I remember mm. that. Uh, the liberation came by the Soviet Red Army on January 8th of 1945. So now we are the scene set for 1944 when it was clear that the German army now moved in with tanks because by that time the Hungarian admiral ruler decided to have secret talks with the Americans to uh, to be liberated and not have this, uh, the Soviets come in and certainly not have the, the Germans come in. So the Germans moved in physically with their tanks and started just uh, encouraging the Hungarian Nazis to find some more Jews and kill them. So my parents uh, found a young couple, nice young couple, quite poor in the excerpts working in a working class area to take my parents in and with false documents. And so my parents felt that it would be very difficult to have me there uh, to, to for my sake and maybe for theirs also. And uh, the Scottish Institute from Glasgow had a, the Scottish mission and they really came into Hungary, maybe in the 1920s or early 30s, to convert. It was a mission had the, the desire to convert uh, the Hungarian people to their religion. And they had created a wonderful school, the Scottish Mission School. So my parents took me there in September for safekeeping. And also to, they, they did have a school. They, they, classes so that we our education was not interrupted mm -hmm. and I was there uh, for uh, a couple of months actually until the end of November when the Hungarian army came in they discovered the cook's son I went to the Nazi Gestapo uh, headquarters and said, hey, you know, that school is not really a school. That's a hiding place for Jewish children. And they came and rounded us up to take us to the ghetto and wherever. And I made it clear that I was much too young and much too beautiful. Uh -huh. And I was never beautiful. Young, yes. Uh, to go with them and the Hungarian young officer to whom I said, I'm not going with you. I, you know, are you kidding? You know. And he said, then run. And I ran. And then I ran back and I remembered that my mother entrusted me to take care of a 10-year-old boy 
whose mother was in hiding with my parents. And I ran back and I grabbed him and I said, oops, I forgot somebody. And then we ran. So you described earlier that when you're part of the Freedom Fighters and delivering leaflets um, to everybody, it was an adventure. You call it Alice in Wonderland, which I can certainly see, right? And, but as you get to that moment where they're rounding up these kids and their intention was to take you, but you convinced this young officer, this, this German officer, I think, that you were too young and too beautiful to be taken. And then he suggests to you to run, which you did. There had to be this moment of complete fear as all these other kids are being taken and they know where they're going. I mean, I, I can imagine like that was part of the adventure. Like that's where it separates to like, this is super real. And, you know, you're doing everything you can to protect yourself, save your life. Yes. Uh... I don't think I thought about it that way. Mm. Um, I think this, I, I have a very strong survival instinct. And uh, if I wouldn't have had it, I wouldn't have run back to grab the kid. You yeah. know, I just run away. And it is just who I am. And, you know, while nobody in my family lived to be very old, even those who could have in terms of the political issues, uh, I, I just, this is who it is. This is who am I. And, and I've been tested and tried a number of times in my life to have that instinct of, okay, I better get out of this one and move on. Or is there something I can do? And probably the reason I became so very active in, in charities is because I could go to those countries where I gave my support and work and live with people who survived, who survived because they never knew anything different than what they lived in. And with a little insight and with a little encouragement, they could rise above where they were and feel encouraged to survive. And to survive with more dignity and more pleasure and more whatever. So I, I think that, that if I could ever figure out who I am, which I have tried, but not much success, uh, it's the survival instinct that sort of like tells you about that kid who escaped several times from several continents. Mm to become who I am and a, a little old woman shrunken from five foot five into five foot. <laughs> That's the dignity, but you have to live with it. Oh, yeah. Um, the, let me ask you this. The, uh, the officer runs, then run. And I know that you went back and you got this 10 year old boy. Where ultimately did you run to? I didn't know. I just ran. I felt that the only place I know where to go to is our old home because I didn't know the address of where my parents were in hiding. Mm. So went home. Our apartment was occupied <clears throat> by other people who moved in as soon as we moved out, whom we didn't know. But there was a family that my mother was very friendly with. Her best friend lived in, our, in the apartment house. And so I rang the doorbell and I said, here we are. This is what happened to us. And we don't know where our parents are, but I figured you would take us in. And Maria, uh, my mother's friend of many, many years, who has seen us grow up, said, no, you can't stay here because her husband was Jewish and she felt that we could endanger her husband's life. And she gave us a sandwich and, and told us the address of where my parents were hiding. And there was a six foot snow in Budapest and there were some dead horses on the roads and, and the exurbs or the suburbs where my parents were hiding the blue colored neighborhood was quite far away from where our home was. But we just walked 
And I still have a frozen knee, frostbitten knee from that day of walking, trying to find my parents. And we arrived to this house and uh, I didn't know what name to look at, ask for my parents. And we stood around and God helped us because the woman who uh, hid our parents just was coming out and saw us and grabbed us into the apartment. And we had a whole conversation about now what? You know, I mean, we have to live in the air. We, every day there was air raid um, that we had to go down to the basement where everybody had to go down to whenever the bombing started. And just as a side to this story, my late husband was a bombardier and flew 52 missions, which is sort of a lot. And he wrote in his diary about the 7 p.m. We had been disrupting the Hungarians' dinner. Every night at 7, we were bombing them. Mm. And when I saw his diary and I read this, I said, darling, you could have killed me. And he went pale. I said, no worry, you didn't kill me. <laughs> <laughs> But just to think of, of the inhumanity of war, he would have killed me. Yeah. He would have killed me. He would have never married me because he wouldn't have known me. All right. But wars do some strange, strange things to people. Yeah. It dehumanizes you when you are up there and you're sending down the bombs. You're not thinking of a 14, 15 year old girl who one day could become your wife if she has, stays alive. So, you know, it is sort of like when you think of what's happening in Afghanistan, when you think of all the countries where people are, their survival is threatened every day, whether it is for lack of food, whether it is for security issues or whatever. It, it, is, it is so amazing to look back and see all the marvelous opportunities given not only to survive, but to flourish. But that wasn't your question. So you always have to hold me, Mark, to, to the mark because I, and that's not age issue. I always been that way. It's all you know, good. It's good all good. Were. No, no, it, it's all good. Look, you, 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 at the end of the day, I can't imagine, as you pointed out, whether it's Iraq or Iran, um, whether it's Afghanistan, whether it's just potential conflict right, right now with Russia, you know, it's just, and, and certainly it's all the things that you went through and how brutal um, Hitler was in terms of what he was trying to accomplish. And, and it's just, it's amazing. And, and as I started the, the podcast up, I saying, you know, my, my goal has always been to speak to a survivor um, and as you mentioned, you know, that list is getting fairly short at this point, you're still a spring chicken at 92. You look fantastic. Um, but you know, that like if you stack up the odds of your survival and all the things that you had overcome compared to the thousands and thousands and thousands that were escorted off by train, uh, to be gassed, um, you know, nothing short of horrific on that end and nothing short of miraculous on your end that you've been able to share all these different gifts that you've had and these life lessons to put so many different things in perspective when some people are out of whack in terms of the way they see certain things. So, yeah. so it's just, it's really a remarkable testament to your survival, your instincts, your gumption for staying alive, your ability to help out others, like that little boy, that 10 year old, um, walking through the snow, giving him a frost bit, bit knee, you know, that's lingered. Um, it, it's, it's really, really, um, it's really remarkable. Um, so as we transition here, and I know your brother, John was a huge influence in your life. Um, you somehow or another make your way to, uh, to New York. Um, what, like, like what year, how old are you in all that? And, and like, how do you start a brand new life with limited resources and everything else? How does that work? Well, you know, after the war was over in January, 
uh, we tried to get back to our apartment and uh, we decided, you know, fair enough. There were no windows that were unbroken from all the bombing, the detonations in the whole city. It was January, it was cold, it was snowy and whatever. And we went back to our apartment and respectfully asked the people who moved in to share with us the apartment. It didn't, it was not, it was three room. Uh, so, and we asked them maybe at some point they could find an apartment where they could move to because this is our apartment. Yeah. Anyhow, <clears throat> so we lived there and we went back to the school and we, I finished, I got my gymnasium, my career. I was 18 years old. Um, I was a student at the music academy. I was hoping to be a musician. And uh, I was 18 and life was very hard under the Soviet occupation. It was, they didn't kill us, but they, the Red Army by then has fought for so many years on so many fronts that their shoes and their boots had, had holes, their clothing smelled and looked very poor. And they were hungry. And therefore they were very cruel. And they took whatever we still had left. Yeah. And, and it was sort of like, like being under the German occupation, but much closer, we, you know, we could smell these guys. Mm -hmm. They raped every woman and girl they could find because they were dehumanized. I felt sad for them, but very scared of them. So anyhow, then, went back to school, had our back our home. We didn't have money. My father had a heart attack, could not go back to work. My mother baked bread and cakes that she sold to feed us. We had that one lovely oriental rug left and she sold the rug to buy pounds and pounds of flour to bake with. It was hard, very hard for my parents. And by the time I was 18 and I graduated from gymnasium, my mother said, you know, there's no future here for you. I want you to leave. And how could I leave my, my aging sick parents? My brother is dead. My grandparents, everybody was gone. Uh, and my mother insisted that she, my father was very well, we were very wealthy before all this happened. And my father sent his brother and his sister and their families away in 1939, when you could still go. And they got visas to go to Panama. When they arrived to Panama in 39, and it turned out that they already had all the Jews they want to have. <laughs> the visa didn't count. And so they moved on to the next country. And they not, were not wanted in that country either. They already had their Jews. Certainly Argentina had its whatever, and they all did. Uh, the family arrived to uh, Ecuador, where they never met a Jew before, and nobody ever tried to go there. Mm -hmm. And so they were allowed in. And when I, by the time, you know, that was 1939. By 1948, when I graduated from school, and my mother said, you have to leave. Uh, we got, I got a visa. And at the age of 18, uh, my, my mother took me to the train to Paris and gave me a baguette and a piece of salami and $20. And I went off to Paris. And just think of it, Mark. Think, think of Paris at 18. Come on, man. After going through that kind of Hitler and Stalin. Yeah. Paris. It's, it's, it's the first week of December. And I'm 18 in Paris. It was amazing. The Hebrew International, the highest, arranged for me to have a hotel room in a very small hotel to wait to go to Trieste to take the immigration boat to Ecuador. 
I had 10 days in Paris. I went to the Louvre. Yeah. Yeah. Imagine. It was incredible. I bought me a baguette every day. And it, it was fine. Went down to the boat. And it turned out that it was a cargo ship. In 1948, there was still a lot of war damage, and you couldn't just find boats to take people. These were cargo ships where they pushed into that little, oh, that wasn't little, but I mean, it was little when it take, took 300 people mm -hmm. on top of the cargo. And every day we got red wine and spaghetti in, in, in red sauce. I think I gained 20 pounds on that trip. It took six weeks to get from Italy to Ecuador because they stopped in so many different places. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, I arrived to Ecuador and I was 18. And it turned out that my family was very poor. Uh, they had trouble learning the language. Yeah. They were fairly old when they went. And they ended up in a small town that maybe had 30,000 inhabitants called Ambato. And that's where my young cousin, who was eight years younger than I, eight months younger than I, and I, we lived there. And, you know, I came from Budapest, the opera, yep. the concert hall. I came from Paris at the Louvre. <clears throat> I was not ready for the Indios, for the local people, sort of like crouching down and, and taking care of their needs and the poverty and the ignorance. It was rough for an 18 year old. You know, it was, that's not where I, that's not what I, I came here for. Mm. But it took a few years before, at least I learned Spanish, that was good. Yeah. And by the time I was 22, actually 21, sort of. How, how old were you when you arrived in Ecuador? I was 18 when I arrived, honey. So four years later? No, it was three years later, and I don't think you're part of this interview, honey. Unless you feel like no, you want to be, and I welcome I'm just you. Listening. I'll be fine. Yeah. No, no. It's okay, though. Uh, Anyhow, going back to it. So, yeah, I, in October of 1952, I arrived to New York and it was, I mean, can you imagine? This was amazing. This was incredible. I didn't even know that there is such a place of, as America. I only knew about New York. Hmm. I always dreamt that one day I'd be there. So I got here and there were a couple of issues that I wasn't planning on, such as work, support. Luckily, I had a British nanny governess when I was very young in Budapest. You know, that was before he came. And so I spoke English, but my English was sort of like Dickensian, like dead as a doornail kind of language. It wasn't exactly, you know, New York slang. No. But I became a cleaning woman. I cleaned houses. I was an illegal alien. And I figured out how to go to night school, went to Brooklyn College. Then it was inconvenient location wise. I had to get there by subway. And then I went to City College because New York is so much easier. And then one day I discovered the new school for social research. And I graduated from there and loved every minute. America has always been my dream. My dream place, it still is. I am grateful beyond gratefulness that this is my home for the last 70 years. Who knew? Well, it's an incredible story. It's an incredible story on, you know, the survival. I have two daughters. One's uh, 25. The other one is 23. And I can't imagine being 18 and being um, sent off with 20 bucks in your pocket in a, 
than a piece of bread to um, to Paris. In Paris, you know, no question, I'm sure it was alive as well. I recently got back from Ecuador. Um, I've been on ships like the one that you just described, so I understand that um, what that's like of going from port to port. Um, I climbed a mountain recently in Ecuador, and even you know, all these years later, you know, it's 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 not Budapest, which I've also been in. Beautiful, beautiful, thriving city, gorgeous. Um, with <clears throat> certainly a huge culture to it. And uh, Ecuador is a different kind of culture, but it's it's not Budapest and it's not Paris and it's not New York. And so here, somehow or another, you make it all the way to New York and, you know, you land and what a blessing. And then you were able to figure it out. I mean, again, going back to the first thing you were talking about was you have this survivor instinct that's buried deep inside of you that's been able to like you land. It's not the best circumstances. You have no money. There's no parental guidance around because it was the circumstance. And yet you figured it out. You just figured it out. And, and now all these years later, you know, you're looking back on your wonderful life saying, you know, what a blessing that you've been able to, to, to live in this great country, the land of opportunity. And I, and I looked down in, you know, between civil rights, uh, women's rights, children's rights, um, you know, you're, you're, you've been on all these different boards and you've been able to contribute and you're, you know, like anybody who'd been through, the, through this, you're beyond years of, of wisdom that you can impart back to all these different people. I, I don't know if I got this right in my notes, but that you had a meeting with Mother Teresa and, mm-hmm. you know, like how, what a blessing that would be because she was the most humble person to always put herself last to help others, you know, and, 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 and that's so counter to what so many people, how they operate their lives. It's me first and everybody else last and her, she was so much different. I can only imagine how she influenced you in some positive way. Well, she was a piece of cake. <laughs> <laughs> She was really, until we started talking about things, but she was not a piece of yeah. She had very strong will, very opinionated. She was very old. And uh, it was wonderful to meet her and spend a day with her and then going to her hospitals and to the Sisters of Charity that she founded and making arrangements to send to her aspirin and the kind of things that she so desperately needed to have. And uh, we, we, we got along very well uh, for a while, and then we didn't. Uh, she, this was during the Clinton presidency. Mm-hmm. And she visited the Clintons at the White House And she tried to convince them about uh, the things that she so objected to. And one of them was abortion, Mm. abortion, right? Uh, Then it was birth control. And she did not really convince them that her way was the only way and the right way. But uh, so she wrote an eight page document after her visit, which she then submitted to them, hoping that even if she's not there any longer in in America, in Washington, that they will remember what she said and what she wanted. Uh, She was amazing. I mean, talking about survival. Yeah. That little lady from Albania did amazing things in the world well you have to you know you have to be somewhat of a pit bull i mean uh, she came across as a little old nice lady but you have to be you know with intent very focused and determined on getting many of the things that she was able to do get done and sometimes i'm sure it would step on different people's toes there's another person that um i've had a super big fascination with her for a long time jane goodall um, you're on her board, I think. And this is the lady that um, was in the, uh, the inspiration around, I think, Gorillas of the Mist, where, she, you know, she's dedicated her life to to really understanding this animal in the wild. And there's been documentaries around her and certainly her ability to go and sit with these different amazing creatures. Fascinating. And I'm wondering how that connection was made. 
I wish I would remember. I think we, we had some friends <clears throat> in common and we met Jane and we started discussing what she's doing and how much she would like me to get involved. And so we took a trip together to her place in Tanzania. Yeah. And it was, oh my God, on that gorgeous lake and where we every morning went into, uh, take, that's our bath for the morning with soap on, on the lake and living amongst baboons that were very unpleasant. Baboons are, are not chimpanzees. They are, they are thieves. Uh. You know, unless you lock your cabin, there is nothing left in your cabin because they take it. Baboons are. We had a lovely time with Jane. And we started Roots and Shoots, which is her favorite organization that she created, which is going into all these communities and villages and inviting young people in to care, to, to care and to work for the roots and the shoots. It is really an agricultural program. And the kids were so proud. They made the biggest pineapples. And they, they're bigger than their heads that, that the kids learned to make. And now they are in 140 countries. They have Roots and Shoots program. Mm. So it, it's really remarkable. And so serving on her board was work and involvement and caring and getting to know her. She's no different today in her late 80s than uh, she was when she was 60. Mm. She's still, right now, of course, because of COVID, she's been very frustrated, but she still kept on working each day in each of those countries. And nothing stops Jane. She's remarkable. She uh, is an inspiration for the world. And she never stopped. She just invents new and writes her books every year and always has her programs at the National Geographic. It is an inspiration to know Jane Goodall. Dear God, yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what a, another inspiration yet. Yeah, I mean, I can only imagine the, the, the various women in your life who've had a huge impact. I want to ask you this one last question um, because I only got involved, you know, probably five years ago, um, raising money to build water wells in, in Tanzania. Um, I've been down there. I've been in these, these, these villages um, uh, helping this higher ground organization here in, in, in some Valley. My daughter was epilepsy and, 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 and trying to do everything I can to help her and help others. And, you know, I'm at a point in my life where I've had a little bit of a success in being able to, to turn around and shine that light on others um, where they can benefit from that. And, you know, and I pale in comparison to what you've done, but what like the common, like at the end of the road, like what, when you're involved in all these different organizations, um, you know, I guess, why do you do it? Or does it still bring, I mean, I know it brings you fulfillment, but there's got to be some magic that at the end of the day, this is what helps fill your bucket in life. You know, I, I, I think that I, I would love to tell you that I am scientifically thinking about through these things and I join organizations because I'm very thoughtful. Not at all. <laughs> Not at all. Awesome. I fall into situations and if they speak to me, I, I, I get challenged. Uh, you know, if you look at the News Literacy Project, which is a remarkable project to look at because it's now spreading through the entire United States, is for trying to teach young people to learn what is true, what is false, what is real, what they should believe in. And that's an incredible challenge because our kids nowadays are so involved with the social media and they love to hear things that sound exciting, that whatever, without really stopping to think, what does this do to you? And is it good for the universe? Mm -hmm. What are we doing for the planet? So it's an organization that is really, truly quite successful in a very unsuccessful time 
in terms of social media and young people. But it appealed to me. I, I was very excited about the possibility to work with young people again. An organization that I'm totally devoted to is called Sunny Center, where people who have been exonerated after 25, 30 years in death row for crimes they haven't committed, yeah. we try to help them. We don't get them out. That's the Innocence Project does that marvelous work. We rehabilitate them. We offer them a home. We offer them an opportunity to, to meditate, to do yoga, to, to get a job, to, to learn to talk to each other, to, to have the social media, which they didn't have, but the, that part which is good and it's important. And we started an organization called Sunny Center because the woman who was for 17 years on death row, Sunny, and her husband, whom she met, he was for 15 years on death row in Scotland, in Ireland. And when he got out, uh, he was asked to make a speech at Amnesty International, and so was Sunny. And the two of them met, and they fell in love. And they got married in our apartment in New York 15 years ago. And they are now doing God's work in uh, rehabilitating people who come out from uh, death row. Love it. So, you know, the, 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 the beauty when you have the time and when you have the money and you have the inclination to go to one extreme to another, it doesn't really matter. <clears throat> I've heard on 12 boards. I've been with Kathy Eldon for probably 20 some years. Mm -hmm. I, I don't serve any longer as her chair. I don't even serve on the board, but I do get invitations to every board meeting. And whenever I'm around, if I can, I still will. Certainly I will continue supporting the organization financially and advice-wise if I'm needed. But uh, Sing for Hope is an organization I helped to start with two opera singers. And if you ever saw any piano on the streets of New York uh, or any of the wonderful concerts that uh, Sing for Hope gives during the time when people get vaccinated, the vaccination centers, we send out the pianos and we send out musicians so that when people sit there being worried about getting a vaccination or having to sit there for a while, we give them music. I love, love and, that. Uh, it's, so, you know, from the sublime to the ridiculous, it doesn't matter. The 12 organizations don't have anything in common with each other. What they have is a sense of hope and a sense of love and the sense of perspective of what the world is about. So how can you be luckier than being able to be invited into those places and be part of it? Well, look, at that's what life is all about. And you've stepped into it. And some people run from it. You've embraced it. You've been through all kinds of different um, experience in your life that um, hopefully most people won't have experienced. But on the other side of that, experiences that everybody should get the opportunity to, to dive into. Um, it's been an absolute honor and privilege to have you on this podcast today. You're amazing. You're doing great work. You continue to thrive. There's no limits to what you can do. You continue to do all those things. And I've got nothing but gratitude for, again, coming on my podcast, Finding Your Summit. So thank you so much. Thank you, Mark. It was a pleasure. You are a very thoughtful man. You listen very carefully. You listen very well. You turn it around into questions and summary that indicate that you really not only listen, but you are compassionate and caring. And this was one of the best interviews of my life. Oh, so, you're, you're so kind. All right, everybody. There she is, the one, the only Eva Heller. Thank you. Thank you.